This is the Inner Chief Podcast, episode 196. At the time, if you can think back this far, television was having this resurgence. Um, Desperate Housewives was on, Lost was on, and we were always the poor cousins to what we term in the business as theatrical releases. They're your big movie releases. And what the big movie releases did was that they actually provide the juggernaut for the soundtrack, you know, the, the consumer products, all of those type of things. But what we were starting to see was that television was leading this. And we had this small movie called High School Musical, made for television, uh, $4 million, and no one wanted to know us. And I mean, I remember at the time begging Sunrise and Koshi to put Zac Efron on television. And, you know, now I look at it and it's like everywhere. G'day, Chief. This is the Inner Chief Podcast, episode 196, with Elizabeth McIntyre, Group CEO of ThinkBrick, on eclectic track records, creative partnerships, and victory through tenacity. I am your host, Greg Layton, founder of Chiefmaker and the Council of Chiefs, and I believe there is a great chief in all of us, and that through listening to the stories, strategies, and techniques of great CEOs, Each of you can find and leave your own legacy through your work. The Inner Chief Podcast is where you will learn how to think and make moves like a CEO. For over a decade, I've helped CEOs and senior executives around the world boldly lead change, inspire their people, and leave a legacy. So every two weeks, I'll bring a deep diving interview with one of these CEOs or another one of a mid to large organization so you can find your own path to greatness as an executive. In this episode, we meet Elizabeth McIntyre, Group CEO of Think Brick, and we talk all about how she built a stellar track record despite an eclectic career path, why a lack of resources was vital for stimulating creativity and innovation, brainstorming your dream C-suite role, and lessons from Harvard and how being tenacious will get you heard as a marketing executive. Before we dive into this week's episode, I have an offer. For those of you that are CEOs or senior executives leading significant turnaround, perhaps you're leading a period of growth, perhaps you're turning around a business that is in real trouble. If so, you want to be certain that the moves you're making are the right moves given your context as a business and where your industry is at. If this is you, contact me directly and I'll give you access to a diagnostic that allows you to analyze the key parts of your business and ensure you're making the right moves in the right order at the right pace and applying the right leadership style to where you're at right now. If that's of interest to you, you can email me directly at info at chiefmaker.com.au. It'll be completely free for any CEOs or senior executives leading turnaround. Now it's time to hear from our superb guest. Well, I'm here with the wonderful Elizabeth McIntyre, Group CEO of Think Brick Australia. Elizabeth, welcome to The Inner Chief. Thank you so much, Greg, and I am very excited to be here. I love your podcast and I've learned so much from all the other CEOs that have been on it in the past. I enjoy it listening to it on my morning work. So thank you oh, for having wonderful. me. Wonderful. Well, <laughs> that's good. Well, we've got, I was saying, we've got a job today. We've got your <laughs> wonderful story to inspire people around Australia and, and the USA and around the world because I think you have a very, very interesting story, uh, a very diverse background through multiple sectors and, and industries and uh, you find yourself uh, like innovating in the world of bricks. I mean, <laughs> What a great story. I can't wait to tell people a bit about that. <laughs> um, but as you know, uh, we have a bit of a tradition where we love to know the background of a lot of our chiefs. So can you tell a bit of a story that sums up uh, your childhood and early days? Yeah, I, I grew up in a small suburb in Sydney called West Pimble. And at a very early age, my parents were very big on community and I participated in the Karingai Swimming Club and there it turned out that I had a bit of a talent for swimming and back then I think, you know, all of these activities after school, I think they were all community focused and no one had to pay for swimming lessons or anything like that 
And so I became this um, competitive swimmer, you know, and and my childhood really was dominated by that. And then I uh, went on and continued that through school and high school. But if I was to characterise my childhood, it was quite a simple childhood. Both my parents worked very, very hard. Um, it was privileged. Uh, but, you know, my father was worked full time as, um, as a lawyer. And then he also worked um, in the Army Reserve. So a lot of weekends he was away. And I often wonder how my mother coped been alone so much but we did things like the beach was our friend we went on beach holidays we went on a lot of car trips um, but it really was about community um, in those days there was something called brownies I think before they became girl guides and we'd participate in in those aspects of of the community and when I look back there's a lot of great memories there and I just think community plays such a big role in developing your self-esteem and also getting that encouragement from people that are outside of your immediate family. Mm. Now, that's a superb story. You and I share swimming as a, as a childhood pastime, mm. and perhaps that maybe taught you a few things about perseverance, following that little black line up and down, I'm guessing hour after hour after school. What was your favourite stroke growing up? I was a backstroker and we used to boast that we didn't need the black line to follow. But I I do remember just a couple of years ago, I think it was 2016 in Venice for the Architectural Biennale and Ian Thorpe was there as well as an ambassador. And I was at Mm. this dinner with him and we both had to talk and I said, you know, I never thought in my life that I'd be at a dinner and I said it takes a special kind of person to submerge their head in water, in chlorinated water for in excess of 10 to 15 hours a week. But exactly. it does swimming. It's a long time with your own thoughts, and mm. yes, mm. I know Daniel Kowalski is one of our listeners. I've met him a number of times. <laughs> top, top guy, great guy, an Olympic swimmer. Now let's talk a bit about first ever work. What did you do as your first ever job as a? Look, I think I had a few things. I became a swimming teacher. I babysat, but I just wanted to talk on this topic a little bit about the importance of work experience because as I was a competitive swimmer I uh, someone in the I think level above me at school who was also a swimmer she said oh if you love sport you really need to go and work for this do work experience with this company it's called Javelin or SMAM sports marketing and management and they have been the company that has managed the Australian Olympic Committee sponsorships. Um, Mm. Back in the time, they managed the Telstra Dolphins. And I went there to do a week's worth of work experience and I absolutely loved it. And then I just went back in the days when you just went back and worked for free. Mm. And I was very, very fortunate at that time to have some amazing mentors who really set me on my course saying, you know, this is the degree you should do. You should go into marketing. And I remember... There was one summer, I worked all summer for nothing and there was the Shell 12 metre challenge and I remember being on this boat with the awesome foursome and I just thought that life couldn't get much better at that point. But I wanted to say that to your listeners Mm. because I think work experience is so important and it's always that sort of enthusiasm or desire to to want to find out what the big world is really all about. (laughs) You know, that's, that's quite pertinent because I don't think anyone's ever really spoken about that work experience that so many of us did back in the day, which was an important <laughs> part of high school. I remember doing mine uh, in marketing at a four-wheel drive parts company, I think it was, <laughs> and ended up doing marketing at school as well, at university as well. Okay, that's very interesting. So, SMAM, and I can see now that took you a little bit into the world of uh, elite sport, didn't it? Mm. Yeah, and I think uh, one of the jobs on one of the times I was there was to go out to the airport and meet the Wallabies, you know, when David Campisi had come back from one of their tours. So it was a lot of the grits and grind, Mm -hmm. but at the same time it was also that, yeah, you had to set up for triathlons, you know, you were, you know, doing events and and setting up at a very sort of hands-on level. So there was no, there was some excitement, but there wasn't a lot of glamour. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And that is elite sport though, I think, what people when you get on the inside, you start to realise that it's 1% glamour, 99% hard work behind the scenes, you know. Now, what was your first ever car? Oh, absolute favourite, a red Toyota Celica, 1984, before they sort of had the curve 
um, yep. model. Oh, so, angular, boxy yes. shape. Oh, yeah. yeah, love that. And I bought it off, it was secondhand, obviously, and I bought it off a gentleman that had traded it in for a Porsche and it was just in mint condition. I love that car. I still love nice. that car. Nice. I don't have it, but I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now let's fast forward a bit. Uh, you, let's get into your career proper mm-hmm. now. So left school, went to university. Where did yep. you go from there? Based on my work experience, I decided, yep, I'm going to get into marketing. I did a business degree, majored in marketing, and then actually sub-majored in sports law and marketing. And I really enjoyed that. But it was right at the time that the Sydney Olympics were about to take place. And I don't know why I got this crazy idea in my head, but... I thought, oh, no, like if I go into the Olympics or go into sport, I won't have a job at the end of it. So I took quite a radical turn and was offered a role as a marketing manager for a small firm. It was a finance firm and it, they were actually a group of actuaries, and which is totally the other end of the scale. I went in there as their marketing manager and they really wanted someone to shake up their image a little bit. So it was great in the sense that I got a whole lot of experience and, and gave me some great finance experience, but it was a little bit off the beaten track from where I'd originally anticipated myself being. Yes, we've actually had two actuaries on this show. Fascinating people working with actuaries. I mean, they're so intelligent. Did, did, did you ever learn anything quite memorable from working with the actuaries about how they approach the world? They're very intense people, extremely bright But Mm. I think it probably, if I look at my key strengths, which are to make complex things very simple now, that was probably the start of it. But I remember one time we were out at a team lunch and someone asked, I think the waitress asked what these, what we did or something like that. And I think the greatest insult I gave everyone at the table, I said, oh, look, we're all actuaries here. And I think they just looked at me and were like, you are not an actuarialist. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh but um yeah okay i'd like to talk a little bit about the fact that you haven't had a straightforward career you've mm-hmm. moved around a lot and in fact you view that as a strength so can you i suppose sum up how your career shifted around a bit but what's really interesting to me is how you were able to shift your skill set through different industries so well can you just talk a bit about that i guess after i went with the actuaries, um, I then became, I think curiosity led me down a few paths. Um, I really wanted to understand how loyalty points work, you know, what's the point of a point. And back in the day, um, there was one company that used to run all of that and they still do a lot of it. It was called Pinpoint. And that was sort of where you had the Qantas Telstra Visa card and you had all of these bank credit cards starting up and you would get bonus points from partners and things like that. So I I really wanted to go and and learn how that worked and I did go there and um, launched the Commonwealth Bank and Heritage Building Society and the Bank of Queensland and a few of those and it was fascinating to see how it works and I, I still tell people to this day, you are paying for your points so use them wisely. And that took me into loyalty and then I was approached by actually someone that I'd met in finance and there was a gentleman, Peter Harrison, and again, back in the day, he used to run Campaign Palace. It used to be a huge advertising company. And he had gone overseas and successfully secured all of these contracts with um, NASCAR through WorldCom, BMW, Formula One. And he was looking to bring this sort of idea of how they made sponsorship work in automotive to Australia for Ford. And he was introduced to me And he sort of said, I want to set this thing up with Ford. Do you still like events? And I still did love events. So we went and pitched to Ford to do their V8 supercar program at the time. And we were successful in getting that. And I knew nothing about cars. I have since become quite the petrol head. But I think what he was after at the time was just the passion around it and the dedication. And I certainly think maybe the mm. eagerness that I had around that. Yeah, wow. Well, so working with actuaries to working in V8 supercars and becoming a petrol head, now that's that's a, a fairly seismic shift. Then you're at Disney 
yeah. working with Disney Television International, and I want to come back and talk to you about that in a second. And then mm. you go to Think Brick, mm. right, which is a building products. Mm. So we're talking four sectors that have no similarity, right? What interests me and what this tells me is that you're running in your head some sort of framework of excellence of process. Now, I might, might be wrong you, <laughs> but what I'd like to know is, is there a leadership framework or process for change that you're running in your head to make things work for you? Because if you keep getting this track record everywhere you go and it's an impressive track record, you must have something. Can well, share? I, appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate that. I think it's it was until... I maybe got out of Ford mm -hmm. that I realised that strategy was definitely one of my strengths. And But everyone likes to say they're strategic now and, and someone told me the other day if I used strategy, that didn't mean anything. But I think probably you've got to have a vision and strategy. But then my biggest strength, I think, is taking people along the journey with me. And I think it's not necessarily the people at the top uh, you know, even when I started with Think Brick, I knew that my biggest asset was going to be the sales reps or the members' representatives that were actually out talking to architects every single day. I knew they were mm -hmm. going to be my biggest strength. Similarly with Ford, you know, I did a lot to actually become very close with the car clubs. And just to give you an idea about what happened with Ford, we'd gone into Ford, they had just just sort of rescinded their contract with the Ford Australian Open. So they'd put all of this money about, I think it was in the day, it was 20 to $40 million into the Ford Australian Open. And they would woken up one day and realised they're not selling tennis rackets or tennis balls. So they decide to put all of the money into motor supercars or V8s because that's mm -hmm. actually what they were selling. And so they did that. But when, when I came on the scene, there was no budget to leverage anything. I, you know, and everyone talks about constraints and constraints make you very, very creative because then I was told, okay, you've got no budget to promote promote this now. You've got no budget for hospitality on track. Um, a lot of the budget was taken up in contract negotiations with drivers or teams. And so really for me it was this tenacity about what's the strategy here and how can I get through this? So one of the things at the time, we used to want to display all of the new cars. We had no budget to pay anyone to clean them. So I would go to the car clubs and I'd say, look, that if you ever want your car detailed, go to someone who's in a car club. And I'd say, mm -hmm. could you do this for me? What can I get for you? And they'd say, well, you can get us 100 posters signed by you know, Marcus Ambrose or Craig Lowndes. Mm -hmm. And so I just learned this way of doing things differently. And, you know, the, another thing that I learned that we had not a lot of signage on track. So then I thought, well, what's going to create movement and colour? What If I was in television, what would I look for? And so we bought all these blue Ford Oval flags and then I would tip off Channel 10. I'd say, over there will be your sea of blue. You know, and mm -hmm. so it was all of these things that, you you know, you could start thinking about and then just be creative in the outcome. By the time I got to be interviewed for the Disney role, they had said that they didn't want anyone in the industry. They wanted someone from outside the industry. And I think from that point I knew then that I had created some real change, some real strategy around it. And I think also... What I'm most proud of is in most of my roles, things have stayed. So, you know, they work. Mm -hmm. You know, like when I went to the Australian Turf Club, no one referred to it as the Australian Jockey Club. They all said we're going to Royal Randwick. So change it to a mm. destination. You know, that's all still there now. Sure, so, sure. Mm. Okay. Uh, there's one thing here that I want to pick up on, which I think you've <laughs> dis described beautifully which is you are taking the strategy of, of how to grow a business or its footprint and you're demonstrating quite clearly how that works on the front line for the salesperson or the, that, that point where your business touches has the touch point with the customer. You seem to have a, a, a wonderful um, brain for working out exactly how that happens and getting scale through that, right, through, so you engage an audience or a customer base or something. Now, I've worked with a lot of executives and sat in a lot of rooms over the years and I think not a lot really talk about how, that, how important that particular touch point is, right? And I think it's so important to be connected to that because that's, that's the lifeblood of your business, right? 
And, you know, I always say it's where you get your best ideas from. It, particularly in this role, I started doing these roadshows every six months with our sales mm-hmm. and reps, and they would always come up with the best ideas. Hey, Elizabeth, we need a fact sheet. Hey, Elizabeth, we need mm. this. Okay, fine. Let's make it happen. But I think as well, you really need to understand what's important to them. And one of the things I promised everyone was if they turned up at 7.30 in the morning, I would give them proper coffee and a hot breakfast. And I'd make sure that we finished on time so they could get out and do their calls. Mm. And I think consistency is big, but I also think it's important to go, okay, give a little bit back. What do people want? Mm. Yeah, that connection to your front line and listening to their their requests and their stories, I mean, that just comes straight back up to when you're trying to make strategic decisions. That's where it should be fed, right, from that front line set of data. And also I think because... When I first took on the role, one of the board directors at the time said to me, you know, the biggest disconnect we have is between board and and grassroots, you know, in their their own companies. Mm. And I think that's just true of a lot of organisations, you know, that they just, it's a hard gap to fill and not a lot trickles down. So I'm really pleased I've been able to provide that little bit of a bridge. Well, I, I think it tells us one reason why you've been able to get it. You have been able to build such a great track record. Tell us a bit about your time <laughs> at Disney. I mean, everyone, like a lot of people, would say, "Wow, what must have been a fantastic job." What was what was it like being working for Disney, and what was the most important thing you learned? Well, I think working for Disney was one of the best experiences of my life. I think it's a very intense environment. And I like to say to people, it's a lifestyle, you know, like you have no life um, and you have to enjoy what you're doing because that's all you're doing. I don't say any of this with, I say it with a lot of enthusiasm and joy. Mm. At the time, we we were Walt Disney Television. We Mm -hmm. managed Disney Channel and Playhouse Disney Channel. Our feed was out of Singapore. Uh, we reported into Hong Kong and we were very, very closely aligned with the US. So mm. at the time I was on, I think I was on a plane three out of four weeks a year. At the time, if you can think back this far, television was having this resurgence. Um, Desperate Housewives was on, Lost mm-hmm. was on, and we were always the poor cousins to what we term in the business as theatrical releases. They're your big movie releases. Mm-hmm. And what the big movie releases did was that they actually provide the juggernaut for the soundtrack, you know, the the consumer products, all of those mm-hmm. type of things. But what we were starting to see was that television was leading this. Mm-hmm. And we had this small movie called High School Musical made for television, <laughs> uh, $4 million, and no one wanted to know us. And, I mean, I remember at the time begging Sunrise and Koshi to put Zac Efron on television. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now I look at it and it's like everywhere. But, again, it was this – and we have a very – in Australia, pay TV, still Foxtel doesn't have a large footprint. Mm -hmm. They like to say they do, but it's only like about 23 to 25% of the population. Mm -hmm. So creating this momentum actually meant we had to go outside of where our channels were. But also it taught me at the time, you know, it was a very pillared company. I know it's changed a lot now, but at the time you had your sort of Disney publishing, you know, you had your um, uh, DVDs, you had your Disney consumer products. And, again, none of them wanted anything to do with television. So it was really trying to bring together this strategy again and take everyone on the journey but also, I guess, get them to put, you know, television first and obviously the success followed but my managing director at the time he was English but had was living in Italy and or had married an Italian and he was very very generous about giving things to departments and being the leader and I learned a mm-hmm. lot of that from him. I'd like to put you in a bit of a weird scenario right okay. imagine you get a chance one day to go and meet Walt Disney Right, go back in time and you go down you know, meet him and he's and he's he really cares for you because he's your mentor, right? And he wraps <laughs> his arm around you and you're an up and comer, you know, you've got some aspiration. What do you think he would say to you as an up and coming executive? Fatherly mentory kind of advice. What do you think he would have said? 
I think he would have said something around on keep the spirit, you know, because I think that's really what Disney is all about. The biggest thing that I learned from Disney mm. is what is the Disney difference. So, and it, it centres around that that entertainment with heart and those bits where I cry a lot. So, you know, in movies you well up with tears and mm-hmm. everything was looking at how are we different. And certainly for me coming into Bricks, that's what I was always about. How are we going to be different? You know, mm-hmm. everyone's expecting Bricks to be boring. Well, guess what? We're not going to be what you expect it to be. So mm. I think for me that was the biggest thing that I learned. Yeah. Because, I mean, the Disney spirit is famous, right, and their, their obsession with the customer, mm. right, they're obsessed with the customer. And I, I've never been to any of the Disney parks, um, oh. but I, I know a lot of people that say they are just the greatest. Well, I always said this was all before I had children and I was so kind of sick of High School Musical, I think I watched it 150 times. And then, of course, without any encouragement, my children think that's the best thing I've ever done and they got on to it and I've seen it again now. <laughs> right, our Chief, more from Elizabeth in a minute. But now two weeks ago in episode 195 of The Inner Chief, we spoke with Shelley Park, CEO of Australian Red Cross Lifeblood, on the loneliness of leadership, gifting humanity and transforming an organisation. Here's what Sally had to say about being at the top of the tree and how it can be lonely. I was talking to my CIO recently about, you know, what career aspirations she has. And as part of that conversation, and I think she'd be okay with me sharing this, she said to me, you know, the CEO role is a really lonely place. And I stopped and thought, I don't want people to think that I'm lonely or that, you know, but, but the reality is it is a lonely place because you do have to just keep that little bit of, and it is separation, I suppose, and it's not that you're cold and it's not that you're disengaged, but you have to be able to make the right decisions for what the organisation or the business needs to actually deliver on your strategic outcomes and your KPIs and, you know, your financials, everything that you do. You can listen to that amazing chat with Shelley Park by going to chiefmaker.com forward slash 195. And while you're there, check out the complete back catalogue of all our CEOs and gurus and mini-sodes. Just go to chiefmaker.com forward slash podcast. Righto, Chief, let's get back to Elizabeth McIntyre. Okay, let's talk a bit about career crossroads. I don't know if you've necessarily been at a career crossroads, but you've certainly, you must have had some very tricky decisions to make. And a lot of people go through their career and go, right, should I stay or should I go? Sometimes I've got no no opportunity to go to. Sometimes I've got two or three that are juggling. How have you handled those career crossroad moments? I think there was this time, and probably just before I began at Think Brick, where I had noticed that with the Australian Jockey Club, marketing, and I think it's a struggle that marketers have had for a long time, is that sometimes we're not taken so seriously, strategically and at an executive sure. level. Mm-hmm. And I really made a conscious decision after that that I wanted to have a C-suite role. Mm-hmm. And then I think what's really important is probably intention. So what I did was I wrote out all the things that I wanted in my next role. Now, if you had told me that that would have been this role that I'm currently in, well, when they rang me for it, I hung up. I thought it was mm-hmm. a joke. But sure. I think intention is is really important and that's what I try to say to people that say to me, mm-hmm. what should I do next? For me, it was about having some autonomy over my team, having some real mandate of control over all the processes. And when I wrote all these things down and right down to the part about where the role was going to be and things like that, you know, uh, when I wrote down everything that I wanted to be, this role ticked all of those boxes. Mm. But I never would have identified this role if I hadn't thought about really what I wanted from it, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, beautiful. I mean, yeah, exactly. You've set, you've set the intention, right, mm. without saying the exact outcome, mm. right, and the intention precedes the outcome. Because I think also you can be quite uh, dismissive of ideas when they come up. If, if you really mm. set yourself on like I'm only going to work for this, this and this, where there's so many opportunities out there that you could work for something that – could really change your life. And I think that Think Brick has changed my life and I'm, I'm tremendously mm. grateful for it. 
Well, let's talk about Think Brick because <laughs> it, it's cool. I mean, as you say, I mean, who in the hell with a creative brain and a you know strategic thing would go and work for a brick company? Uh, and then I look when we was doing the research on on your background, I was looking at all this these amazing brick patterns and all the hundreds of colours and the way that architects are using it now. And I'm thinking, I might build myself a brick house. I was never going to, but maybe I will. And you've got this great design behind you of this think brick and it's all in <laughs> pink and wonderful colours. So tell us uh, a bit about what think brick does and then um, how you brought your skill set to um, just thinking about what it could do in the future. So firstly, Think Brick is actually a peak industry body. So we're a category and the main thing that Think Brick does from a technical perspective is we sit on around 60 Australian standards committees, right? And that's to make sure that Brick is built correctly. So we represent our key manufacturers in Australia like Austral Bricks, PGH Bricks and Pavers, Brickmakers and Midland Brick in WA. And at the time, and we are now rewinding back 10 years, can't believe it's been that long, but um, at the time, Brick had become very complacent and also it was considered by designers not a very, I'm going to use the word sexy material. There were all these new substitute materials coming out and designers really wanted to embrace those. And I think that Brick's greatest strength is also its greatest weakness, right? It lasts, okay? So everyone mm-hmm. looks at red brick buildings that are still standing or that sort of sandstone mm-hmm. and they think, okay, that's the only two colours brick comes in. That was their their key issue at the time. And I was actually building, we were renovating a, a brick house and I could understand from that very gla- grassroots because I'd said, oh, I I really want to build the extension in brick. And I had all this pushback from my builder and I was built, brought up with parents that believed in literal bricks and mortar. So I was, I could see the issues that they were having. So for me, it was not only could I see the problem that they were having, I could also as a consumer know really what I could do to fix that. But interestingly enough, this was around about 2010 and when they wanted to have someone with a marketing background because they wanted to do a really big consumer campaign. Mm -hmm. And so it was going to be great. We're going to have all this budget. We were going to do a consumer campaign. And then the GFC hit. (sighs) And I think one of my members withdrew out of the levies, 80% of the levies. And it's one of those moments like I have during Mm. what we've just experienced with COVID where it's like, okay, so this actually wasn't going to plan. So then for me, it was really about, well, what is something that none of our members are doing well at the moment? And what is the 1% that's really going to move the needle? That's one of my favourite sayings. It's like, what's the best impact that we can have that's going to actually make the greatest change? And Sorry, what we I just, just want to capture that. So what, are no, what is something that none of our members are doing right now? Yep, doing oh. well. None of them are doing well, yep. And what is something that's that, the 1% thing that will, do, will shift the needle significantly? Yep. Okay. And right. Because I think as well, like just to give a little bit of a background, is my members are competitors. Outside of the boardroom when they come to me, they all hate each other. Like, I mean, <laughs> that may be harsh and some of them might deny it, but the reality <laughs> is you have yeah. to find the one thing that's going to unify everyone. Mm-hmm. And so... I identified at the time that the the biggest group we could concentrate on were the architects. And the reason for that is architecture is a little bit like fashion design. So not everyone can afford to buy Chanel or Louis Vuitton or any of those big fashion designers. But what happens with those designs is it trickles down. So in Australia, about 5% of Australians build their house using an architect, but they also look to architects to see what trends there are. Mm-hmm. 80% of houses are built by building designers and, and really what we wanted was that trickle-down effect by engaging with the architects. And I will say in those early days when we started the Think Brick Awards, I think there was like 25 entries and architects only liked recycled brick. Now, if you're representing brick manufacturers, that is a very... <laughs> I'd brick to swallow. But now we we started the awards and, you know, we had 
have had, I've been very tenacious about it and that would be my only other tip. Mm -hmm. You have to keep the end goal in sight and just keep chipping away. Sometimes you may go off on a path or you may, you know, not go exactly the road that you thought, but keep coming back to keeping everyone on the same vision. And, mm-hmm. and I think that's important from a, from a grassroots perspective as well as a board perspective. And uh, maybe two years ago, one of my board directors said, you know, I just can't believe, Elizabeth, you've been so tenacious. I never thought we'd be here. Mm-hmm. And it's true. Now we have these awards nights, well, we didn't last year, that have, you know, 600 architects in the room and we're all celebrating built projects and they're all built in brick. When we started the awards, it was a conceptual competition. We had to actually pay architects to design a brick building, pay them, and they didn't even have to build it. So (laughs) that's where we've come from. Now, I'd like to pick up something here, which uh, this uh, theme coming through again where you've gone to that touch point of the business, architect to builder, right, and you've gone to learn from them about maybe some of their challenges and you experienced Mm. it yourself, right? So Mm. once again, taking strategy to the front line. I'd like to ask you a question though, a a bit about what you learned from Harvard. And Mm. so you said before, marketers tend to not get a seat at the table because they're not really strategic, right? Well, they get a seat at the table. I don't know whether they're heard. (laughs) They're not heard, yeah, yeah. So everyone wants to be listened to. What is uh, the best set of uh, learning you've ever done around strategy that has given you some sort of good enough, maybe it's not one thing, maybe it's a whole range of things, but a lot of people ask me, where do you go and learn about strategy? So I often ask other people and say, where did you learn? Well, I think it's really difficult to answer that question because you learn on the job, don't you? And I think that when I went to Harvard, there were two things that stood out and it takes a little bit back to my childhood. There was Mm -hmm. 113 people in this course from all around the world and 95% of us were competitive sports people when we were younger. Hmm. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. So I think strategy is around vision, but then I think a lot of it is around discipline because everyone's going to tell you what's not going to work. That's what's happened to me a lot. People have said, this is never going to work, Elizabeth. I mm. remember when I got to Ford, they call it the paddock just near the, the track, and sure. I was trying to speak to some of the team owners And they said, oh, we're never going to listen to a Sheila in this paddock. And they just walked off. And so I thought then the best thing I can do now is just stand in these garages and watch and learn. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. I think presence is very important. Mm -hmm. But from a strategic perspective, I think you need to have that vision and then the execution of it is, is very important. And so often we see some great vision, but no execution. And sometimes I think with leaders, you need to really remain, in old terms speak, in the trenches. You know, you need to be connected to it because that's when you find out where where you're not getting the traction. And it's also very hard to listen to, but I've had a lot of constructive feedback. And I would say that when I first started these Think Brick Awards, all the architects had a very big opinion on what was wrong with them. But mm-hmm. I listen to them and mm-hmm. that's another way of engaging. So I think that that's probably how you are able to refine strategy and vision. But mm-hmm. I certainly, I think that from strategically, I would say programs like Six Sigma, where it's about the process and establishing yep. processes, I think that's very important because you can always go back to that. Uh, and it also makes you think about once you've started putting something in writing, where are the holes in that? So at Ford, for example, I had to do a strategic document for every single V8 supercar round that would go to the vice president and the president of Ford. And that Mm -hmm. could show every department what we were doing. And it's very similar to now how I present to the three boards that I report to. What's the strategy? How are we fulfilling it? And how's it been executed? Yeah, superb, superb. What was the second thing you learned at Harvard? You said 95% were sports people. What was the other part of the experience? Oh, the other part of the experience was preparation. So uh, I, one of my board members had actually been to Harvard to do his MBA mm-hmm. and he said if they ever call you out and you don't know the answer, that's what Harvard's renowned for, 
I was completely petrified. I mm-hmm. did all of the pre-work. I read everything. I tabbed, tabbed everything. And the thing is when you get to Harvard or any of these Ivy League universities, the actual lecturers are like rock stars. I think one of them looked like Mick Jagger and he certainly had the moves for it, Tom DeLong. Mm. And mm. everyone was scared of, you know, being pointed out or asked this question. Mm. And I remember in this first lecture we had to go through this case study and they asked the question after you read this case study was Greg a good manager and I won't go to the nationality of this person but she goes yeah I think Greg was a good manager and everyone like audibly gasps because it was so obvious that that person was not a good manager and she hadn't done the reading oh no <laughs> and I think so I think For me, Harvard taught me just so much about preparation and Mm. it's really important to do your research because also because I'd done all that research, I could really enjoy the lectures and learn more. Whereas if you were struggling to understand the context of things, that makes your life even more difficult. So those were the the things that I – context is very important. Yeah, nice. Okay, there's another theme of things going through here I'd like to pick up on. Confidence. Okay, (laughs) so you get – a couple of old school roosters in the middle of the paddock tell you, I'm not going to listen to some Sheila, uh, <laughs> you've got an all-male board right now, you're dealing with the uh, president of Ford. Look, confidence is an absolute game changer when you can get it inside someone's bones. Firstly, I'm going to ask two, two questions here. One, where do you draw your confidence from? Secondarily, if someone isn't really naturally confident or doesn't really back themselves... What advice would you give them to build their confidence? I think, so my confidence, I wouldn't actually say that I'm a confident person, but I accept that that comes across. Uh, I think I'm, I'm going to say le- you're in the top 50th percentile, like you're in the top half, right? I, by nature, I'm a Leo. So I, I've always <laughs> wanted to, you know, Leos are extroverts. So I've always wanted to, to I guess, you know, be that sort of connector or or go to that person and ask them something. I think as well, I've often found out that if you go and ask someone something, people normally say no. If they are going to say no, they normally say no very nicely. And the other thing I want to talk about is that really everyone's human at the end of the day. I think I've had so many no's or, you know, big, or people passing me off you get a bit of a thick skin about it. So I think it's that sort of the confidence or the daring yourself to go and ask someone to do that. So where do I draw that from? I think innately I just draw it from this inner sort of driven motivation that I I just would like to know the answer myself and that I'd rather be told that myself or I want to go and put myself out there. Someone asked me how I made a good presenter or how could you be better at presenting? And I hate presenting, but I made myself do it. So I, I, I don't know whether that's a sadistic quality in, in myself, but it's always doing those things I think that you you don't like because the more and more you do them, the better off you get at mm. ignoring that fear. Well, you're, you're a competitive swimmer, so you're definitely sadistic by nature. <laughs> Well, also, I think when you're swimming with a group of young guys that are telling you your chest is in competition with the wall, you know, that, that's at a very young age, you, you know, that builds your confidence up a bit. You, you can't go much further down than that. Oh, God almighty. But your second okay. question around, I guess, what do people do to become more confident? I think small wins are really good. So I think, you know, if you've got... If you're feeling nervous about speaking to someone in particular or asking them, just set yourself a few little goals. And then one thing that I used to do a couple of years ago, I'd imagine someone that I thought was really confident and that could be an actress or, uh, you know, like what would Mm -hmm. a Meryl Streep do in this conversation? You know, what would Meryl Streep do in this? Or, you know, what would J-Lo do in this? And just take a bit of their energy on. Maybe Mm -hmm. even go so far as to kind of impersonate them in your mind. And exactly. then after that, yeah. congratulate yourself and go, next time's going to be easier. Yeah. It's always hard the first time around, right? I mean, were you nervous the first time you walked into a boardroom? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah, <laughs> of course. Everyone is, right? Because you're like, oh, my God, what happens in here? I mean, all these smart people. It must be crazy, right? Yes. Okay. What about one final question about the way you, I suppose, manage your yourself and your, your psychology is resilience and tenacity. 
Mm. Like, you know, you've you've described it any number of different ways today in 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 your own Elizabeth fashion. How do you like a lot of people get a setback and it really hurts them? Yeah. Or they get that heavy feedback. Mm. Is there some sort of hack or something, or is it just natural where you just go, okay, like failure is feedback, or is this is there something there that says, okay, that's the hurdle I've got to get over? How do you deal with that and keep moving? Because you're obviously brilliant at it. <laughs> well, thanks. I don't think I am. I think one of the biggest misconceptions is that leaders aren't human, you know, and I think that we've all had those disappointments. And sometimes yeah. You, you just don't want to show up to be a leader some days. Oh, yeah. But yep. you you kind of have to make yourself do that. I guess there are two things I would suggest. One, I'm getting better at saying to myself, do you know what? This is a crappy situation. Feelings are meant to be felt and just sit with it for a little bit, right? Mm-hmm. And maybe just, you know, don't put yourself in a position today that, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe change some meetings around if you're feeling really low energy and things like that. But then it's just sort of putting that one foot in front of the other. And again, Mm -hmm. small wins, things that you know can move you forward, that you know you can have an easy win on. And even if they're just really inconsequential, just Mm. setting yourself some small wins. But I don't think anyone's immune to setbacks and I don't think resilience is easy. And I think the stronger people are or they seem the harder it is because they're always expected to be really, really strong. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I think everyone's heard the old thing, if you're not getting setbacks or not failing, you're not pushing hard enough, <laughs> you know. And, I, and in your world, I mean, you just have to. You're going to get setbacks. There's no mm. clear pathway. You've got so many competing voices and angles and challenges that people turn up with every day. Mm. You're just going to have setbacks. This is par mm. for the course, I think. <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. Yes. <laughs> now, I want to ask a couple of uh, quick fire questions in a minute. Mm-hmm. Um, but before it, I want to ask one more question about Harvard. Sure. Now, a lot of people will be asking themselves, look, I've got to do, I need to do a bit more formal education. Um, maybe they're considering an Ivy League school or, or one of the best schools like INSEAD or London Business School mm-hmm. or something, even some of the great ones we've got here in Oz. And they might be asking themselves, what should I do? Right? Should I go and do an MBA uh, or should I do a bridging program, one of the smaller programs? So first and foremost, is it valuable for everyone to go and do something? Because like, sometimes people do it and they're not ready for it or it's not right. Like should, who should go and do something like that? I think, again, it comes down to your attitude. Like I love learning. I'm one mm-hmm. of these lifelong learners. And so for me, like Harvard, university, it's my happy place. But at the same time, I think you, you're you going to have to want to do it. If you, for example, don't want to be like that person that didn't prepare at Harvard, then it's it's not the place for you. And maybe there's another way that you can learn, which isn't necessarily that. I also think with MBAs or even masters, I've just been counselling some of our interns here. They're, they're wonderful, but nothing beats experience. You know, nothing really beats the experience. So I sort of encourage people either to wait or to take a lot longer to do that degree if they want to keep learning. So, for example, maybe you start your master's or your MBA and you do one or two subjects every year and that allows you to to keep learning. But, you know, it takes you a lot longer. I did my master's in international business I don't recommend this. Well, I had two children as an adi- mm. and worked full time. But I think at the end of it, I felt that I'd really achieved something and I also kept my hand in learning. Mm. But I just think that intuitively everyone needs to know what sort of a learner they are. And if mm. they're not willing to read and, and do assignments or do questions, then don't do that. Find something else that is a little bit more attuned to the way that you learn and experiences are great like that. You know, going away with a mastermind group, that's another way of learning, learning from other people. So that would be my advice on that. But I I certainly think that I look for people that are are wanting to develop themselves and whether that's from a technical perspective or a leadership perspective, both of the Harvard courses I did were around leadership And I really enjoyed those experiences and I got a lot from them and I'm still implementing a lot of those things today. But that's not where everyone wants to be. Mm -hmm. That's perfect advice. Wonderful, (laughs) wonderful. Okay, closing quickfire questions for all chiefs. What is the number one book you recommend for professionals of all types? 
Well, I love The Alchemist by Paul Colio, and I read that nearly every year. I especially read it when I'm having one of those setbacks. Yeah. I read it on, I just read it like three weeks ago. Yeah. Again, for about the fifth time. And it's amazing. It's a great book. Yeah. I would also just say anything by Malcolm Gladwell. Um, Interestingly enough, there's a book he's put out recently called Talking to Strangers. I read that book and then I did the thing that, you know, you're meant to look out for, completely blindsided myself and I was like, I just read a whole book on this, Elizabeth. How could you miss that? Um, <laughs> the Art of War I think is really interesting. Oh, and serious. Yes, and I would say I've become a massive fan of the Bill Gates reading list. So I read a lot anyway but everything mm-hmm. he's recommended – is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> what is the best way for people to connect with you? LinkedIn, Instagram. I, I'm mm-hmm. yep. So those are the best Superb. ways. Yep. Excellent. Can you nominate another CEO you hold with great respect? You think we should put on the inner chief? I was thinking maybe Jane Herdicler. I mean, she's just taken over Virgin. Yes. You know, she's had wow. an A2 milk experience. I've yep. met her and she's mm. a pretty phenomenal person. I reckon she's mm. got some good stories in her. Oh, yeah, and, and a really tricky last year and a bit. Yeah, she would be fascinating. We'll try and lure her onto the show, eh? <laughs> okay, if you could lead any organisation in the world, I'm going to give you the keys to anything. Can't be Think Brick. Yeah. What would it be? I've actually got two answers to this. Good. They're very different. The first is along the lines of entertainment. Well, I'm a very big, still have always had entertainment in my blood. And I've been watching a lot of what ILM, which is Industrial Light Magic, which is the George Lucas company, and what they're doing with filmmaking now. If you don't follow Star Wars or any of the Marvel sort of series, what John Favreau is doing with that technology and how they are now actually filming movies is amazing. But I'd love to look at how could we make that beneficial outside of movies? Like what could we apply in in da- everyday life or something that could help a sector or a community? That's how I'd like to see that technology applied. Now I've watched The Mandalorian, which John mm. Favreau directed, but I'm not familiar with the technology. Can you give an example of what that is so I can... Uh, Capture. Yeah, so, well, you can go back, if you've watched The Mandalorian, go back and now watch all the gallery around it. And what they have actually done is all of the sets now are pretty much green screen. Wow. So they're just creating, but it's a 360 green screen. So they're, oh they're creating, yeah, and it is, it's amazing. But they, he talks a lot about how, you know, he started that on The Jungle Book and then they got to The Mandalorian and, and just the innovation mm-hmm. and that trying and where they've got to. So wow. it's pretty fascinating. But when I was watching it, I kind of think that is amazing, but how could we use something this valuable mm. for other purposes? Okay, that was one organisation. Yeah. Second one? The second one would be around um, sort of plant-based eating because I think that, Everyone's probably seen David Attenborough's documentary and I've looked at a lot of documentary. I've watched a heap of them. And I do think for this planet and for everyone's human bodies, plant-based eating and and plant substitutes to meat are really important. And I think as well it's another one of those areas that it, it would create a lot of, would require a lot of awareness and also there's a lot of, I guess, myths around you know, is it good for you? Where are you going to get your protein and things like that? And I Mm -hmm. think there's a really delicate way you could market that, which wasn't going to necessarily pay out beef or chicken or or poultry or anything like that. So that, because I'm passionate about that. I think Mm -hmm. the only other thing I want to add is that everything I've done outside of the cars, I really believed in. Um, I did believe in the cars in the end, but you've got to be Mm. passionate about what you do because if you can't, if I can't get excited about bricks, I could never excite you about bricks. That is true. And you said you're now a petrol head. <laughs> well, right, if I could give you keys to any car in the world, what would you take? Oh, I do like the Jaguar F Type, but oh, I don't think nice. I've driven enough other ones yet. Nice, nice. <laughs> what is a final message of wisdom and hope you think is vital for the next generation of executives? Look, they're just two things. One is, I think, keep going. You never know who you're inspiring or who's looking up to you and you never may know that. And the other thing is I think just remember you're only human. So be kind to yourself. 
Nice. That's a beautiful way to finish, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for your time and energy and wisdom on The Inner Chief. Thanks for having me. It's been very fascinating. Chief, that sums it up for this week. All the links and resources can be found at the page for this episode. Go to chiefmaker.com forward slash 196. And as always, remember to stay epic.